Okay, I think maybe we can start. Shane, all yours, stage is yours. Okay. All right, hopefully you guys can hear me and see my screen and everything is all good. Um, but I'm gonna be talking today about a tool called Darshan. Um, I'm one of the lead developers on Darshan. Um, it's a IO characterization tool developed at Argon. Um, and today I'm gonna to be talking about how you can use um, Darshan to enable um, application IO understanding and doing so in a, in a HPC landscape that's uh, constantly changing. Um, so to kind of set the stage um, to motivate the problem, um, as I just alluded to, HPC systems are pretty uh, complex. Um, they're always changing. Um, so it kind of creates a lot of issues for users and how to understand um, what's going on on these systems. Um, and in our case, we're, we're looking at, you know, IO and storage systems. Um, and in this case, you know, there's a deep layers of IO libraries that have to coordinate with each other. So, you know, traditional um, MPIO stack going down to the storage layer, but that's also, you know, exposed to HDF5 and um, other higher level IO libraries that really kind of are, are super convenient for users, but they obscure a lot in the ways of, um, you know, the performance implications of doing specific things. Um, you know, there's also entirely new to HPC um, storage um, software. Um, so things like object storage, um, Intel Deus comes to mind as things that are going to have to be um, contended with going forward. Um, so there's already kind of a, you know, a rich landscape of different IO software libraries and middleware and stuff that has to be contended with. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, there's, you know, more emerging storage hardware, like persistent memory devices, and also um, different storage architectures uh, that expose, um, you know, storage hierarchies like uh, burst buffers and other sorts of um, storage accelerator technology that you can find on these systems. Um, IO analysis tools are really helpful for helping to navigate this complexity and to, you know, offer users um, tools to better understand IO behavior. So this, <clears throat> this could be um, individual users um, characterizing IO behavior of their jobs to help inform tuning decisions, um, but it could also be um, broader, you know, system-wide IO stack um, characterization using um, you know, all kinds of jobs that might run on a system to get a better feel for, um, you know, how storage resources are used more generally and ideally using that information to, to optimize deployments. Um, so I mentioned we're going to be talking about a tool called Darshan today. Um, again, it's an IO characterization tool for applica HPC applications. Um, so just uh, we'll, we'll be covering a lot about Darshan today, but I'm going to start with some some basics. So hopefully there's a little bit of information for um, not only new users, but also existing users as we kind of move through the, the presentation. But we'll start with some some background, obviously. So Darshan is just a, uh, a lightweight IO characterization tool that captures um, concise views of application IO behavior. Um, it basically, for every job that it instruments, it produces a uh, summary of IO activity for, for, the, for the job. So this could be um, counters, histograms, um, timers, and other sorts of statistics. Basically just um, you know, what, what kind of information we can capture in a fixed amount of space um, for, uh, for each job that's instrument, instrumented. Um, so beyond this default mode where we're trying to capture as little as possible, we also have um, the ability to request full IO traces. Um, and this is helpful for if users really want finer grained information that Darshan doesn't uh, capture by default. Um, some characteristics about Darshan that make it um, attractive to use. Um, first, it's, it's widely available. So it's deployed and um, usually enabled by default at a, a number of um, HPC facilities around the world. Um, including at NERSC. Um, it's easy to use, so there's no code changes required on users' behalf. Um, they can just uh, basically, um, you know, the most they would have to do is recompile their application um, to get Darshan instrumentation. Um, and there's there's negligible performance impacts. So there's um, this, this notion that you can basically just turn it on and leave it on. And it's just kind of um, not really uh, obvious to users that there's something happening in the background. Um, and it's also modular. So this is a, a this one gets us a lot of bang for our buck in that we can continuously um, enhance or extend Darshan to instrument new IO interfaces or storage components. Um, so that's also another really nice feature. Um, 
Hey, Sh uh, Shane, can, can I ask one real quick question? Sorry, it's Richard. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so where does it send the, the output? Uh, is it something that we can capture as a center for say all the jobs that are running Darshan? That's right. Yes, and that's that's basically what's happening at Nurse now. Is there's a, a default uh, Darshan module available that's capturing for you know applications that have been compiled there, um, you know, instrumentation and, and logs that users can access. I can, or I'll get I'll get more into that in a, in a few slides. So hopefully that'll that'll, that'll answer some questions. And if uh, please please stop me if um, this is a long presentation, so it might be nice to have a little bit of a conversation. So. Um, Stop me if you guys have questions or if things aren't clear, and I'd be happy to to stop. Um, but just a, a little bit more about how how Darshan works is um, it inserts um, e application I/O instrumentation at like, at link time. Um, this is traditionally how we've we've done things a lot, a lot of times is um, for static and dynamic executables, just offer Darshan um, compiler wrappers or other ways to integrate into the compiler so that Darshan's linked in um, and that you get your instrumentation directly. Um, there's also an ability to use LD preload for, for dynamic executables, in which case um, at runtime you just point at the Darshan library and instrumentation happens that way. Um, starting in version 3.2.0, we actually have the ability to instrument any dynamically linked application. Um, this is important because traditionally Darshan has been tied to MPI, but we've, we've broken that dependency at least for dynamic executables, which is um, going to be, you know, we'll talk about this more in some future slides, but it's something that we're excited about. Um, more about how Darshan works. So essentially, um, there's this notion of instrumentation modules that you can see on the right side of this figure here. So there's instrumentation modules for different layers of the stacks like HDF5 and MPIO. And those are responsible for uh, implementing uh, function wrappers for you know, IO calls that we want to instrument on capturing statistics we want to gather. Um, and so that basically happens as the application executes. And then what happens at shutdown time is that um, Darshan, the Darshan core library will collect all this information, aggregate it, compress it, and write it out to a log file. Um, and then after this, you'll have a, a log file that you can use Darshan um, analysis utilities to, to look at. So there's a Darshan job summary tool that provides a nice PDF summary of um, characteristics of the IO. Um, there's Darshan parser, um, which provides a complete dump of all the text, um, all the counters in the log file and PyDarshan, which is a Python analysis module for Darshan logs. And we'll, we'll cover all of these a little bit in some detail um, as, we, as we move forward. Um, so next we'll cover um, what might be of interest to a lot of you folks is how to use Darshan on Cori. Um, so for traditional MPI applications, which is, as I mentioned, what the Dar Darshan has traditionally um, been most concerned with or, or tied to, I guess, is um, we have a uh, you know, on and or installed and on by default software module available on Nurse Cori. Um, so if you log into Cori and use module list, you should see a Darshan 321 um, module there. Um, that's the currently default version. Um, if not, for whatever reason, if you've messed with your environment or whatever, you can obviously always uh, explicitly module load it. Um, but essentially what this does is it gets a Darshan software module in the environment that knows how to inter interact with a uh, Cray compilers to insert um, Darshan linker flags to, to integrate the instrumentation. So it's pretty transparent. Um, for HDF5 applications, um, so this is also for MPI applications, but those that are using HDF5, we have a separate module specifically for these. So if you have um, an HDF5 application and you want to know more details about HDF5 API usage, um, we have a Darshan instrumentation module that can provide you that sort of information, but it is not part of our default um, Darshan module on Cori. Um, the reason for this is mostly just because uh, Darshan with HDF5 support obviously has a um, library dependency on HDF5, and we don't want to, you know, carry that around to all, all applications running or compiled on, on Cori. So basically, we don't want to introduce a HDF5 dependency for non-HDF5 applications, which is understandable. Um, and obviously, you can use, use module switch to uh, switch from the default 321 Darshan version to the HDF5 enabled one, as I, as I show here. Um, one thing I, I will note is that this module is only compatible with Gray HDF5 um, versions 1.10 plus. Um, I can't 
recall whether there's anything older than that on Cori available. Uh, there might not be, in which case it's not really that important, but just something to, to keep in mind. Okay, so we've covered um, how to basically get a Darshan module on Cori into your environment. So the, the question is now what? Um, so basically at this point, you can just compile and run your application. Um, Darshan will integrate directly with the Cray compiler wrapper and insert um, the necessary linker flags to get Darshan um, into the executable, um, regardless of whether you're using static or dynamic linking. Um, as I mentioned, LD preload is another option for dynamically linked executables. Um, we've noticed that this is definitely a requirement for uh, Python frameworks, so things like MPF or Py and H5Py. Um, those obviously Python's dynamically linked itself, so you can't recompile Python with Darshan support. So obviously your only other option is to use LD preload to, to insert the instrumentation at runtime. But that, that tends to work. It's not necessarily a big deal. It's just something worth uh, pointing out for, for Python users. Um, this LD preload mechanism is also useful just in general for applications that can't be can recompiled or just don't want to recompile. Um, it gives you an option to to insert Darshan instrumentation without, without going through that, if, if that's useful for you. So here I have some you know quick snippets that show how to set LD preload. So you can use uh, module show Darshan to get the LD library path, um, and then you could point LD preload at the libdarshan.esto um, file that's contained there, and then um, just run your application like normal, and you should get Darshan log data. Um, another um, thing, I, slightly uh, hinted at earlier is our support for non-MPI applications. So this is something that's relatively recent. Um, so starting in Darshan version 3.2.0, um, we support instrumentation of non-MPI applications using LD preload. Um, so again, this is only for dynamically linked executables. Um, users must uh, additionally set a different environment variable here to, um, to signal to Darshan that you definitely want to capture um, non-MPI information and to write logs. Um, the reason for this is mostly just because if users set LD preload and kind of forget about it, that uh, Darshan will just generate log files for literally every process that's being run in the environment. So you'll get you know, log files for LS and PS and all kinds of different things that you're probably not really interested in. So it's important to maybe kind of limit the scope of what's being instrumented by um, setting this um, for regions of interest. Um, one thing worth noting, um, if users are interested in trying this, is that the Darshan 3.2.1 module on Cori that's available by default um, has a bug that prevents um, non-MPI mode from working properly. So you can't just you know, load that module, set LD preload, and set this environment variable and run because there's a bug. Um, there's no theoretical reason this shouldn't work. Um, so this is something we'll have cleaned up in future releases so that this default NERSC module could support both use cases. Um, but in the meantime, it is it is broken. Um, so what, what users can do to work around this if they're interested in the meantime of getting non-MPI instrumentation is to just do like a SPAC install or a, an otherwise manual install of Darshan themselves. So I have a simple uh, Slurm recipe here for installing the Darshan runtime library without MPI support and with Slurm support. Um, so that could, um, you know, something that you could do yourself manually if you're interested in testing this out, but we will, you know, get this squared away going forward. Um, so after your application terminates, you know, regardless of whether you used LD preload or the, the, the linker options for Darshan, um, you should have a Darshan log file that you can start analyzing. Um, so the first step is to look for it. Um, for for system wide installs of Darshan, like the one available to, by default on uh, Cori, um, you know all the log files go to a central site wide directory where everyone's you know information is just kind of stored in one one spot. Um, you can query Darshan using this Darshan config utility to find out exactly what the log path um, is, and you can see on Cori it's located in the the global C scratch file system. Um, so that's where you'd need to start your search for your particular log file. So if you CD there, um, you'll notice that within that particular site-wide log directory that there's further um, you know, de uh, organization of the directory hierarchy into a date. So there's a, a year directory, a month directory, and then a day directory. Um, so you basically have to CD further down into the day that you ran your job of interest. And then you can find the log file there. Um, and all the log files have the same, um, you know, pattern for their, their naming. So it all starts off with a username. So in my case, uh, starts off with S Snyder, uh, followed by an executable name. So this one was MPI IO test. 
um, and then you can see it's followed by a job ID and some other kind of metadata. So it's, if you have if you have all the information you need about finding a job, it's pretty straightforward to kind of map that to the Darshan log files that are that are relevant. Um, one thing worth mentioning is that the spec installed version of Darshan simply puts uh, log files in your home directory by default, um, just to have somewhere to put things. Um, you can override that with an environment variable um, to give it another directory to just kind of store things in. Um, this isn't formatted the same way as a system-wide directory. It doesn't have like dates and things like that. So it's just literally a huge directory to store you know, individual log files in. So it's a little bit different, but um, should be manageable. Okay, so we've covered a little bit of background on what Darshan is and how you can get started using it on Quarry. So at this point, we, we know how to integrate Darshan instrumentation and we've presumably got a log file that we can start analyzing. Um, so there's some Darshan log utilities that can help here. Um, so generally what I do as a starting point is just copy the log file somewhere else, um, so, you know, either to my laptop or to another directory just to kind of hold it um, and make sure I don't lose track of it. Um, and then you can just operate on it directly using the Darshan utilities. So the first one I'll cover is just this uh, Darshan parser utility. Um, and these will all be available in Darshan path if, uh, or sorry, in the path environment variable if you have the Darshan module loaded. Um, so keep that in mind, they should all be available for you. Um, but essentially um, you run Darshan parser on the log file and you can get detailed counters um, describing accesses to it. Um, so I have some example information here for MPIO module and Darshan's POSIX module that shows the type of information we capture and the kind of the format for it. Um, all of the modules follow this, this general format, um, but it shows the module that captured the particular counter information, so POSIX um, or MPIO, um, then the rank. So in this case, negative one just uh, indicates that this was a shared record, so every single process um, in the application accessed it. Um, then there's a record ID, which is just a unique identifier that Darshan has for um, records. And then there's the, the counter information. So um, the counter value and also the counter type. So we have things like opens or read and write counts and, and things like that. But that's only just like a you know a small snippet of what we capture, just to give an idea of what Darshan parser can, can provide. It basically gives you a complete dump of every single counter in the log file. So it's a, it's a lot, but it's really useful if you know what you're looking for. Um, so, if, you know, as I'm kind of alluding to, this isn't so accessible for a lot of users. Um, we do offer a, another tool called Darshan Job Summary, which seems to be pretty popular. Um, it generates a, a PDF summary of application IO behavior. So it's, you know, some nice figures and graphs and things like that the users can look at um, and not be overwhelmed by the, the parser data. Um, this particular utility, um, we do recommend, or you know, I typically recommend to, to copy it somewhere off the production systems, um, mostly just due to LaTeX and Perl dependencies that kind of make it difficult to get the tool to work properly. Um, if you do it on your laptop, you have a lot you know, more success in installing whatever packages you need with your package manager or whatnot. So just a, a general tip or trick um, for that in case things don't work directly for you. In, in any case, um, once you invoke Darshan Job Summary, you just pass it a log file um, like the ones we copied. Um, and then you'll see down at the bottom here that um, there is an output uh, PDF file that's generated based on the Darshan log file name. Um, let's see, yeah. So um, just generally go, walking through the kind of information this provides, uh, just starting at a high level, um, it's just just generates a, a multi-page PDF containing a bunch of tables and graphs, uh, performance estimates and things like that the users can use to kind of orient themselves to general IO behavior of their application. And we'll, we'll step through a few of these um, in more detail in the next couple of slides. Um, so starting with the header, um, so at the very top, you'll get some, some high level metadata for the job. So that includes, you know, job ID and user ID, but also um, job size in terms of you know number of processes, how long it took to run, um, generally useful things to to have after the fact in the Darshan log file. Um, there's also IO performance estimates that we can provide at different interface layers. So here you can see that we're able to provide a general um, MPIO um, bandwidth value, um, and similarly something for standard IO, which is you know the, the file stream uh, API 
Um, so we have a few different estimates we're able to provide just straight off the bat. Um, looking at some of the graphs, um, one of the, the first ones is average IO cost per process, which I have here in the upper right corner. Um, you can see that this captures across a few different APIs, so across POSIX, MPIO, and standard IO. Um, read, write, and metadata, uh, average timings for each uh, across all processes. So I can show you like on average how much time is being spent um, by all processes doing metadata operations versus read or write and, and so on. So you can see here for this particular example that um, at the POSIX and MPIO layers, there's a little bit of uh, metadata traffic um, more so compared to um, the read and write um, costs. Um, one thing that you can look for in this particular graph is that there's a lot um, and what this in this picture, the pink um, is other or basically anything that's not IO, so compute. Um, if you see that um, computes dominating um, this particular graph and there's limited opportunities for IO tuning. So that's one th one obvious takeaway you could make from this particular one. Um, in the bottom right, there's uh, some more um, IO operation count. Um, Histograms kind of showing you the for different API levels or API layers what um, what operations were used and the relative intensities of them. So one thing you could look for here is um, you know like a a lot of uh, metadata operations or things like that. Um, we've noticed obviously that those can have a adverse performance impact for applications. So it's something that you could look for in this particular um, operation count graph. Um, next is a um, access size histogram. So we can provide access size histograms for both POSIX and MPIO layers, um, just to give a better idea of uh, access patterns for the application. Um, in general, um, we usually you know, recommend that, or suggest that larger accesses are better for most storage systems. So if you tend to see a lot of really small, like on the order of kilobytes or so, uh, access sizes, that's uh, an obvious place where it would be um, useful to, to try and do some optimizations to aggregate those requests into larger access sizes that perform better. Um, and there's also some, some tables. So as an example, there's a, a file count summary table that shows, you know, for different file types, um, you know, how many files were accessed, their average size of, um, you know, the amount of work that's being done to them and, and things like that. So for, um, in this case, you know, there's, we can provide information on read only files and write only files and, and, and so on. Um, one of the, the last things I'll cover is a little bit of timing information in these PDF summaries. So we're able to provide not only for um, independent files, which I have here, so you know, files that are accessed by a single process or something like that, um, or you know, multiple processes independently. In this case, uh, you can see the, the bounds for when read and write activity was actually happening. So on the top, you can see that most of the reads happened um, you know, in this particular example, like around two seconds or so, while most of the writes happened around um, one second. And you can see, in general, um, you know, with, with ranks on the y-axis and time on the x-axis um, where um, IO happened. Um, so that's all just some really basic usage of some of our existing tools. Um, I have a few tips and tricks I'll, I'll mention here for obtaining a little bit finer grain details um, from Darshan data. Um, let's see. So the, the first one is something that, oh, hello. Go ahead. All right, sorry. Um, this is Brian Austin from NERSC. I had a question about your previous slide. Um, and just to, to clarify, if you were um, interleaving reads, like you, you read, you, suppose you read a batch, process it, then read the next batch um, and, and proceed in that way. This is, I, I just wanna be totally sure that this doesn't capture the time spent reading. This, this captures the time from first read to end of last read? Uh, yeah, that's that's absolutely right. So this this captures, it's not a trace or anything, so it doesn't have like every operation, but it will it will keep for, you know, each rank, the time that it first read something and the time that it last read something. And you have to kind of, you don't necessarily know what the intensities of the operations were within those bounds, but it does at least give you a starting point to, to know, um, you know, where IO is happening. 
Now, if your application's doing I/O right at the beginning and then right at the end, then it's kind of like uh, it's not super helpful in that case. In which in which case, we'd recommend doing something um, with tracing or something more finer grained. And while you have a slide up with uh, with timings on it, um, what's the Darshan's approach to asynchronous I/O, or is this all for for synchronous I/O? Um, that's a good question. Um, we do support instrumentation of asynchronous I/O, um, but you know. As you might expect, I'd, I'd urge you to be cautious about the insights you kind of take away from it and that, um, you know, we start the timing for asynchronous operations when the operation submitted, as you would expect, um, and we end the IO timing uh, whenever the user actually tests for the completion of the operation. So it's possible, obviously, that the operation may have been completed much quicker than the application tests for it. So, um, you know, it's not going to be, um, it may not be super helpful in, in that case. But we do we do instrument it, so it's it's part of our operation counts. It's just the uh, the asynchronous is a little bit more difficult to instrument from a timing perspective. That's a that's a good question. For sure, thanks. Okay, so um, ways to kind of focus analysis a little bit. Um, the the Darshan job summary tool I've um, been walking through that works on an entire job. So every single file access, it'll kind of aggregate all of that into you know a single uh, PDF summary describing all of the files accessed by a job. If instead you want to um, you know focus it in on a particular file of interest, then you can use this Darshan convert utility to transform a existing Darshan log into a Darshan log that contains only a specific file record of interest or something like that. And then you can uh, pass that back through some of these other utilities to get a, a more focused um, analysis. And, and kind of along those lines, there's a, a Darshan summary per file tool that will just do that Darshan job summary for every single file. Um, so that's it's helpful in some um, specific use cases. We don't you know, recommend that in general because there could be a lot of logs or a lot of files instrumented. So it could you know, take a, a while to generate all the summaries for them. So, um, but it is possi possibly useful for, for um, applications that don't touch a lot of files. Um, going back to this uh, timing stuff that I shared on a few slides back, um, but um, for shared files in particular, um, it, it kind of seems that Darshan isn't able to provide as finer grain information as you might want. So as you can see here, we're looking at shared file access. So the top two panes are related to independent files. So there's nothing there. And in the shared files, you can see that the the timing uh, durations kind of span, all, or particularly for write, span the entire uh, application execution time. Um, what, what's happening here is that Darshan collapses uh, records that are shared across all processes into a single um, record um, that collectively describes the access. So it throws out a lot of the uh, timing information for individual processes and just provides you like a, a global view of it, um, which is fine for you know a lot of depending on what sort of analysis you want to perform um, but if you're interested in some of the finer grain details of collective IO um, then it, you probably want to um, disable that uh, shared file reduction so there's a environment variable you can set at runtime to for Darshan to say don't reduce any shared records just keep all the per process information and then that will uh, produce these sorts of graphs. Um, it'll convert the shared file graph from the previous page into something finer grained per process like we have here. And it'll give you obviously a little bit more information that would be otherwise um, obscured by Darshan's uh, shared file reduction. So this is another kind of tip or trick that you could keep in, keep in mind if uh, you have <clears throat> collect, collective workloads that you want to learn a little bit more about. There's a way to you know, force Darshan to save more information in there. Um, and I'm oh, sorry. Uh, lastly, uh, obtaining finer grain traces with DXT. So DXT is uh, this Darshan extended tracing module that comes with Darshan. Um, this is something that you can request at runtime. So you need to set a environment variable to request trace data. This um, DXT enable IO trace variable. Um, and if that's set, then Darshan will start up a couple of uh, additional modules to instrument MPIO and POSIX um, to, to trace those basically. So it'll use a fixed size buffer um, and try and capture as much tracing information it can and store that with the Darshan log file. Um, and similarly, we have a uh, Darshan DXT parser that can be used to dump the text format trace data. As you can see here, it's kind of like a similar format to our other parser tool, but it's um, not counters, it's actual individual read and write operations. 
Um, we also, we don't have a whole lot in, in the way of DXT analysis tools yet, but that's something we're interested in. Um, we do have one um, DXT analyzer tool that was contributed that can um, read the uh, text output from that um, DXT parser tool and convert it into a graph like this that shows, you know, for ranks on the y-axis and time on the x-axis, what the where read and write activity was happening um, in an application. Um, so this is again useful for you know if you if you don't think Darshan was able to pr provide you the information that you that you wanted with its uh, default um, instrumentation mode, this will provide you a little bit more finer grained details that you can dig through yourself. Okay, so that's um, hopefully that's useful for folks in the audience who um, don't know much about Darshan or haven't had a chance to use it a lot. Um, what I'll cover next is uh, still useful for um, you know new users, but also really probably helpful for existing Darshan users that don't know about what what we've been up to. Um, so one thing that I've um, already teased that was this HDF5 instrumentation available on Darshan. Um, so just to, to motivate this, um, is something we did in our ECP project. Um, uh, HDF5 is, you know, again, a really convenient library for data scientists and, and users for organizing uh, large amounts of data, but it really kind of obscures what's happening at lower levels of the IO stack where you have more control over performance. Um, so it creates a situation where, it, yes, it's a useful API, but um, users may not have a great intuition about how to improve or to use it best. Um, so we created an HDF5 module to help us um, instrument this better and to help provide details there. Um, so we're focusing specifically on instrumenting HDF5 file and data set uh, APIs. Uh, and we're generally just looking to answer questions like, um, you know, what are the file and data set properties? Um, how are data sets being accessed? Um, how are data sets organized within files? Are, are files containing tons of different data sets? Is it generally just a few of them? Is there any sort of performance implication from having a lot of data sets in a file um, and, and so on? Um, and lastly, um, how do uh, you know, high level HDF5 library accesses decompose into the lower level MPIO and POSIX um, accesses where performance is really um, controlled at? Um, and if not, uh, do any optimizations make sense? Um, so just kind of simple questions like that that can better inform on HDF5 usage. Um, just to kind of quickly walk through the types of information we're capturing in, H, in, each, H, uh, in each API, sorry. Um, for HDF5 file API, there's really not a lot of interest that we're capturing. Um, there's just not really a whole lot of insightful stuff that happens at this layer. Um, mostly it's just um, file um, basically just operation counts for the file open. So anytime the user opens or creates a file, we instrument that and also any flush operation issued to a file. Um, beyond that, we capture whether uh, the user requested to use the MPIO driver. Um, and then we also capture some metadata timing. So the amount of time spent in like open calls and things like that. Um, so not really a whole lot super interesting here, um, but it it is, um, you know, helpful for, for mapping HDF5 file APIs down to um, what's happening um, in data sets, which is what we'll, we'll cover next. So for HDF5 uh, data set instrumentation, there's a lot more of interesting um, stuff happening here because this is where the actual read and write calls and, and things like that are happening. So again, we have, you know, operation counts like opens and creates, um, reads and writes to a data set, um, flushes again, um, we can capture the total number of bytes read or written to a data set by an application. Um, we have access size histograms, like I showed earlier for POSIX and MPIO, but these ones are capturing the amount of data moved at the HDF5 layer for each um, reader write call. So that again gives you a kind of a, a, a understanding of how much data is being moved by each um, data set access. We also capture information on selection types. Um, so whether the users are using just like regular hyperslab selections to select big, um, you know, chunks of a, a data set, whether they're using regular hyperslabs to select a bunch of, um, you know, not, not as well um, defined um, portions of the data set, and then also point selections for use cases where people are selecting just particular points in the data set space. 
Um, we're capturing information on uh, data space dimensions and points, just to give an idea of you know, the dimensionality and how large these things are. Um, we're capturing chunking parameters to see if users are setting those themselves and what they're selecting for them. Um, we're also collecting information on whether MPIO collectives are used in HDF5. So that's a, that's an option that users can set in HDF5 to try and use collectives and we capture whether they, they did so. Um, we also capture whether any deprecated HDF5 functions are being used still. Um, and we also you know, capture a bunch of read, write, and metadata timing, um, similar to what we do in other modules. Um, just to kind of quickly walk through a HDF5 example that kind of demonstrates uh, the sort of insights you can get from using the HDF5 uh, instrumentation module in Darshan. So I just did some, um, some simple uh, test runs of the Maxio uh, IO proxy. Um, so it has an HDF5 plugin that can generate some um, interesting IO workloads. Um, you know, I tend to do a lot of work with IOR for testing and stuff like that, but I wanted to try something that was maybe a little bit more irregular and um, I guess interesting in, in, in what it was doing as, a, as an example. Um, and so Maxio, um, for this particular example, I just did like a 6D process, a uh, single shared file, um, 3D mesh. Um, so writing about a, a gigabyte of data um, using this um, benchmark configuration to see what um, we could learn from the HDF5 data. Um, one thing I'd, or the only thing I really changed in between runs is whether uh, the HDF5 module was using collective or independent um, IO configurations. And you can see down here on the bottom, I've plotted uh, you know, the average per process time spent in IO in each case for different uh, IO layers. So you can see there's a, a, a huge difference in, in what's happening here. And that's not, not necessarily surprising because I'm, I'm sure a lot of us are, are well aware that um, collective IO can be a huge net win for particular IO workloads. And, and this is obviously um, one of those. So on the left side, you can see for the independent configuration, um, how much time was spent in different API levels. Um, you know, one thing that stands out is that um, POSIX IO is, is completely dominating the uh, time here. Um, you know, well over two thirds of the application runtime is in POSIX IO. Um, HDF5 has a pretty high overhead itself here, um, and MPIO is basically negligible. The, the reason for this is that this workload just doesn't really decompose well um, independently down into the, the POSIX layer. So at HDF5 layer, there's a ton of you know, computation going on to break the data set accesses down into corresponding um, you know, POSIX accesses. Um, and at the POSIX level, these accesses themselves are generally really small and inefficient. So they take a long time to complete, which explains the, uh, the high POSIX um, cost here. And also, as I mentioned, the high HDF5 cost. Um, MPIO is doing nothing more than passing the, the independent calls down to POSIX, so it's really not doing anything at all, which matches with the, the timing here. Um, the collective configuration, on the other hand, is an order of magnitude faster. Um, you can see that HDF5 and POSIX are basically not even um, visible on the uh, IO process or the uh, IO cost graph. Um, and you can see the MPIO is, is where most of the time is spent. And, and that makes sense because you're, you're paying a price at the MPIO layer to do collective uh, buffering algorithm, which gives you uh, more performant um, you know, storage system access, but it comes at a cost of a little bit extra uh, communication that has to happen at the MPIO layer. Um, but obviously it's, it's well worth it in this case. Um, as an example of some other information that we can get from um, instrumenting HDF5, um, we were looking at the, uh, so Darshan also captures, you know, the most common accesses issued by an HDF5 application, and it captures information on, you know, like what dimensions, uh, you know, what size along which dimensions were being accessed um, in the, the data set read or write. And we plotted those here with uh, some radar plots. Um, and there's a couple of different configurations here. So there's a 2D um, um, mesh on the left and a 3D mesh on the right. And for each, there's a couple of different um, you know, configurations on mesh size. Um, it just basically generally shows you um, what, uh, how, how big each access is along each dimension of the data sets that are used here, um, 2D or 3D. Um, this information isn't super useful in itself, but what we um, think could be useful is comparing this 
uh, these sorts of access patterns back with um, HDF5 chunking parameters that users are either setting themselves or, or maybe not setting at all and seeing whether um, the way the data set is accessed um, matches with the way that it was configured from a, a chunking perspective because that um, obviously can have big uh, performance impacts. So that's something that we're kind of excited to, to try here as we have more time to play with the HDF5 data. Um, let's see. Um, moving along, um, one thing I haven't teased yet is data instrumentation. So this is something that we're actively working on now. So it's a uh, work in progress, um, but basically we're looking at how to integrate um, you know, support for Deus APIs into to Darshan as that's gonna be um, you know, useful in our next generation systems. Um, so for anyone who's not aware, Deus is basically um, this object storage system that Intel's offering. Um, it's going to be you know, a new interesting use case for uh, HPC applications. It's going to provide you know, object-based storage directly over um, some hardware like storage class memory and SSD devices that's gonna um, have really nice performance characteristics that are good for applications. Um, but um, we also, you know, this is kind of, kind of new, so it's something that we don't fully understand that well, so it'd be great to have some Darshan instrumentation better characterizing this. So there's a couple of different APIs we're interested in um, for Deos. Uh, the first is DFS, libdfs. Um, this is Deos' POSIX file system emulation API. Um, and there's also libdeos, which is their native object keyval API. Um, and you know, we want to instrument both of these as we think it'll you know, be helpful for gaining insights into the different types of applications that are using de Deos, you know, whether this is um, legacy POSIX applications that are using Deos via Fuse, which you can see over here on the graph to the right, um, at the far right, there's a, a, a Fuse daemon that uh, um, POSIX applications can use to indirectly use Deos. And there's also you know, application and IO middleware uh, direct usage of Deos APIs. So this would be happening via HDF5 vol or MPIO or, uh, and, and so on, but um, basically instrumenting direct access to Deus APIs as well to provide more information. Um, focusing first on DFS, um, what we're kind of instrumenting here. Um, basically, we're modeling this very closely after our POSIX module, which makes sense because DFS is a uh, POSIX emulation layer. So we're capturing a lot of the same, same operations. Um, there's uh, you know, additional things like um, punch and, and stat that uh, DFS implements that we're also capturing. Um, we're capturing, again, bytes read and written, um, access size histograms. We're capturing uh, Deus parameters like file chunk size, which uh, controls the distribution of Deus data um, inside files. Um, we're capturing information on DXT usage. Um, DXT is this uh, strict consistency mode for DFS that um, forces it to behave like a you know, POSIX compliant consistency um, as opposed to a, a weaker consistency mode they also offer. And um, we're also capturing um, the corresponding object record ID for the underlying uh, libdeos. And that's so that we can um, map instrumentation records from libdeos back to libdfs to kind of compare how, how they, um, how they um, work with each other, I guess. Um, and we also, again, capture read, write, and metadata timing. Um, as far as, as where we're at um, in this process with integrating data support, um, libdfs instrumentation is basically completely done. Uh, there's a few tweaks we still wanna do, but this is available basically to use if folks were interested in, in it. Um, so if you are, uh, feel free to reach out to me, um, but it's not something that's been released yet. Or, um, it's something we still need to kind of fine tune. Um, for libdeos itself, uh, we're capturing, and again, this is the native object API that the Deus exports. We're capturing um, more operation counts, so things like open, um, fetch, which is the libdeos uh, read uh, equivalent, and update, which is the write equivalent. Um, we're able to capture um, any enumerations that are done on uh, object keys um, and things like that. Again, we're capturing total bytes read and written, access as histograms. Um, as far as libdeo specific information that's useful, uh, there's some object class parameters, so we can capture information on the layout used for an object. So whether it was uh, static or dynamically striped, um, redundancy parameters, whether you know replication was used for this object or whether erasure coding was used. Um, and we can also capture information on which Deus container and pool um, that this particular object belongs to, along with some read, write, and metadata timing. 
Um, one, one thing I'll mention about Deus that's interesting and we're thinking a lot about is how to, uh, to properly instrument um, uh, interesting stats out of the uh, Deus APIs that fit into Darshan's idea of kind of a flat counter space. Um, so this hasn't been much of a challenge in the past, but with Deus, you know, a single object is an entire key value store. So there's a lot of information that can be associated with a single object. So we're trying to think more about um, the best ways to capture this sort of information um, to characterize how, how applications are accessing different keys and, and so on and so forth. So this is something that we're still um, very much thinking about. So LibDeus instrumentation is not implemented yet. And this is kind of something that's uh, next on my to-do list. Um, moving forward to another um, interesting feature. This one is PyDarshan, which I mentioned earlier. Um, it's not related to any, you know, runtime instrumentation uh, aspects of Darshan, but it's more about analyzing logs after the fact. Um, so traditionally, we've had a, a C-based API for um, accessing Darshan logs and um, that our tools are basically all using. Um, but this isn't super convenient. Obviously, uh, users aren't fired up about writing analysis tools in C um, for very good reason. Um, so for most Darshan analysis tools, um, we're relying on some ad hoc mechanisms for getting Darshan data. Um, one of the popular ways of doing that is just to take the full text output of the Darshan parser tool and extract the data you want from the text there, which is really, really cumbersome and, and not the way we would you know, want to do things if we could if we could say so. Um, so one thing we've, um, or one thing that we've um, added to Darshan, and this is um, courtesy of, a, of Jacob Lukow at DKRZ. He did most of the development work here. Um, so big thanks to him. But um, we've added some Python uh, tooling and uh, modules to help with uh, analysis of Darshan log data. So PyDarshan is based on Python CFFI, um, and it provides some Python bindings to our lower level uh, C API, but it also uh, defines some Python bits to help organize this data better and expose it to, to analysis scripts that are interested in Darshan data. So it exposes you know, information in pandas or NumPy or in dictionaries, um, as, you, as you might expect. Um, and we're really hopeful that uh, PyDarshan will lead to a, a richer ecosystem for Darshan log analysis. Um, beyond what we're, what we're doing now. Um, one, one example of some interesting stuff we've been doing with PyDarshan is sharing analysis via Jupyter Notebooks, which are obviously um, become pretty popular. Um, so in particular, we uh, you know, use this to share code, documentation, and visualizations with different users and collaborators. So just as a, a quick example of um, how you could use PyDarshan, um, you know, just a few lines of code here you can, um, import Darshan in, in the notebook and load an a entire log file in with a single command and then you know, report some info, some basic metadata on it on the left side. So, um, you know, which, what, the, um, what the executable name was, how long it took to run, number of processes, a lot of the, the information you get from Darshan, Darshan parser, but exposed to Python. And on the right side, you can see with just a, a couple of uh, additional lines how you can start plotting um, histograms and other kind of uh, plots that characterize the data contained in the report. Um, so this is stuff we're still kind of, uh, still wrapping our heads around and starting to, to write more analysis tools, but um, I think it'll be useful for, for Darshan users to start writing their own custom um, analysis scripts. Um, so yeah, it's it's a beta version of PyDarshan is currently available in PyPy if you're interested in it. So you could you can literally go out and pip install Darshan now to to get it, and you can analyze Darshan long files that way. Um, but you can also um, install PyDarshan manually alongside Darshan util um, if you build it manually. So there's a couple of different options there. Um, but again, this is something that we think will allow us to revisit a lot of our analysis tools and extend them and um, just generally make them um, better and um, less cumbersome to use. Um, quickly cover a few other upcoming features that might be of interest. Um, and Darshan 3.3.0, which is our next release, which we're hopeful to get out next week, um, we'll have an auto perf instrumentation module. Um, this is contributed by Sudhir Chinduri at ALCF, but basically AutoPerf um, provides two different modules. Um, one provides um, MPI communication counters for an application. So it'll be nice to have not only Darshan IO analysis data, but if, if desired, you can also get some information on MPI communication counters. 
Um, and there's also a Cray XC module that has some comp compute and uh, network counters for Cray XC systems um, that'll also be useful to um, have alongside Darshan log data. Um, we have some um, users contributing a PNET CDF instrumentation module. So Clara Lee and Waking Lao at uh, Northwestern um, have been working on this contribution. So we're excited about that. Um, I've also worked a bit on um, instrumenting some ability in our non-MPI mode to gracefully handle applications that call fork. Um, we've, you know, since non-MPI mode has started, started being used by users, um, this is something that um, we've observed that wasn't working um, properly with Darshan. Um, so we've integrated some code that corrects that and um, gives you sane information for applications that call fork. And as I was alluding to on my previous slide, um, we're very much interested in enhancing our analysis tools and report generation based on uh, PyDarshan. So if we can ever, if we can ever find time to do so, we, we're very interested in um, getting some better tools out there for users. Um, just a couple more slides. I wanted to to kind of end with something a little um, more unique that doesn't fit well with other things we've described today. Um, and this is using Darshan as a a foundation for some broader system-wide analysis of IO. And this is about a tool called Gauge that um, was presented at Supercomputing uh, and one of the corresponding workshops, PDSW, this past year. Um, so some, some <clears throat> colleagues from Texas A&M have designed this tool, uh, Gauge, um, that um, does a lot of things. But what I'll focus on today is kind of the IO clustering and analysis aspect of it. Um, I've got I've got links down here in the bottom right to the, the papers um, and, and thanks to Mahalo at Texas A&M for providing all this content. Um, but if you're interested in machine learning um, and its use in IO understanding and, and, and things like that, this, these will be some great resources to check out for, for more information on this tool. Um, but at, at a high level, basically what it's doing is it's allowing, um, it operates on like a huge population of Darshan logs and system administrators and IO experts can use it to gain insights into different classes of workloads that run on supercomputers. So it's using this HDB scan hierarchical clustering algorithm to organize logs into um, different clusters that uh, exhibit similar IO characteristics. So it starts with a huge job population at the top and then kind of uh, create smaller and smaller clusters that represent more unique uh, kind of IO characteristics as you move further and further down. Um, but what you can do is kind of analyze different clusters to see what performance characteristics they have um, and to see what other kind of applications are similar and get similar performance. Um, and there's a lot of other kind of machine learning uh, aspects to this study that I'm not covering, mostly because they're out of my technical depth, but also for time. But um, uh, users or anyone that's interested should, should definitely check this stuff out. But um, if you select a particular cluster, then you can see that uh, Gauge is able to provide a lot of performance characteristics for applications in that cluster. So it can provide information on the user and application details. Um, it can provide pr parallel coordinate plots um, that show um, the general performance of different uh, configurations um, and <clears throat> general performance, uh, general access characteristics at the very bottom. So for these jobs, like what kind of access sizes are being used and, and things like that. But it's just really a good example of uh, uh, a tool that's using a, a bunch of Darshan data representing jobs running on a system to offer broader insights into the system IO usage. Yeah, I think that's that's it. Uh, um, I know we've, we've covered a lot today. Um, hopefully it's useful for folks that aren't familiar with Darshan and also with those of you that have had a chance to use it, hopefully some, some bits stuck out to you as being useful or um, something that you could take back to your particular research topics and, and things like that. So hopefully um, folks got something out of it. Um, but mostly what we what we covered was, um, you know, how to use Darshan's, um, use Darshan and how to integrate or take advantage of new features that characterize new um, IO interfaces and, and things like that, like MPI or sorry, HDF5 and Deos, um, and also kind of IO insights enabled by different Darshan tooling, whether it be just our simple tools that come with Darshan or, or tools like Gauge that are third party and um, provided additional insights on Darshan data. Um, and again, uh, obviously really interested in seeing how, how PyDarshan works out and see if it can, can lead to a lot more interesting Darshan analysis uh, use cases. Um, I've got a lot of resources down here at the bottom that might be interesting. Um, you know, 
website, um, you know, our GitLab webpage, nurse documentation for Darshan, um, so on and so forth. Um, but happy to take any questions um, with whatever remaining time we have. Um, and you know, thanks, thanks all for attending, listening to me talk for an hour. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Shane. I've got a question. Can I ask? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Great. I mean, people thanks. might drop off, but yeah, we, people who can stay should ask questions. Go ahead. So Shane, thanks. That was a, a great talk. 35% um, uh, of our users submitted uh, jobs last year that used Python and something like 80% of our users use Conda environments. So um, I just want to make make sure I understand. So if a user wanted to profile IO with Darshan, if one of those users wanted to do that, I guess the way we would tell them to do that is that they just set up the LD preload setting and then they just run their uh, Python application from within their Conda environment as usual. Is that the only thing that they would have to do? Um, maybe, I think maybe Alberto might might know some about this too, but I, I believe the uh, issue with uh, users that are rolling their own kind of uh, Conda HDF5 install is that it does, it's not compatible with uh, the Cray HDF5 uh, that's being linked with our, you know, Darshan HDF5 module. Mm -hmm. In that case, I think, unfortunately, what you, I, I think it does work, but you have to install your own uh, Darshan version that uh, links against the Conda HDF5. Um, Alberto can correct me if I'm wrong there, but I think that he was working with some users that, that tried that. Yeah, yeah, you're you're right. Um, we we noticed we did, we had some some workloads with, uh, for example, Steve uh, MLPerf mm -hmm. um, workload that, that we weren't able to instrument uh, with the the, the 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 workload with Darshan because it was coming with, with a different HD5 uh, library, so we had to rebuild Darshan specifically with the uh, HDFI library coming out with 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 that conda, uh, so yeah. Apart from from that, it usually works works fine if if you don't have uh, a conda provided HDF5. Okay. So you just need to preload uh, the Darshan lib and enable the non MPI variable if you don't have MPI in your in your job. Okay. Okay. And um, can you say anything about container support? Uh, that's a good question. Um, we're, there's something we're still trying to, to figure out. I don't, I don't see any reason why it, it shouldn't work, but there's some, obviously it's, it, it complicates the, uh, the process of you know, building and installing and setting environment variables in the right spot. Um, I'm working with some HEP uh, workflow systems that obviously use uh, containers very liberally. Um, and it's, it's tough to, to get things completely right. Um, so, it, 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 part of the challenge is me trying to communicate with other teams um, and not necessarily having access to their containers. So uh, some of this might just be like miscommunication stuff, but from a technical perspective, I don't, I don't see why it should work and we have s some success. I think it's just more of a um, getting things done properly, um, if that makes sense. Because I mean, you've got to um, find the right place to install Darshan install, uh, and store Darshan log files and, and so on. Um, and it's, it's a little more complicated in a virtualized environment like that. But I think we can um, spend some more time to probably find some documentation or something like that we can provide for users to give better ideas on how to make that work. Thanks.